speaker, um, Joan Chow from University of Johannesburg, and his talk will be entitled Comparison of Taxon Specific versus General Local Stats for Targeted Sequence Capture in Plant Phylogenomics. Let's welcome John. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for the work I'm presenting today, um, this is work I did as a PhD student at the University of Washington with Dick Olmsted. Genome scale data, including hundreds to thousands of genetic markers, are increasingly being used in plant phylogenetic studies. Such data is often necessary to adequately resolve rapid radiations and ad adequately address issues with gene tree incongruence caused by incomplete lineage sorting and hybridization. The use of genomic data has been made possible by the development of next generation sequencing technologies. A run on one of these machines can produce billions of base pairs of sequence data. This is enough to fully sequence the genomes of many plant species. Although for a phylogenetic study where we want to include multiple species, sequencing the full genome of all the species would typically be cost prohibitive and wasteful since many parts of the genome in uh, consist of repetitive regions and other non-informative regions. So instead, for the same sequencing effort and cost, we can sequence useful subsets of the genome for multiple species, um, as shown in these red bands on this cartoon. There are different ways to enrich for subsets of the genome, as listed here. For the work I'm presenting today, I'll be focusing on the probe-based enrichment, uh, also called sequence capture or hybridization. In this approach, uh, from a pool of fragmented um, genomic DNA, we use RNA probes to capture those fragments in color that have a complementary sequence. So we're left with a pool of fragments uh, that were isolated by the probes, which we can then sequence. So in this approach, one of the first decisions we have to make is what probes to use. In other words, what loci from the genome do we want to capture? For phylogenetic studies, we typically want single copy loci, which would simplify analyses and loci that are present or have orthologs across the clade we're interested in. In plants, until recently, there were no universal probe sets that targeted these sorts of loci. So people have been developing them on a taxon by taxon basis. In a clade, by comparing genome or transcriptome sequence data for several species, like for example, just few species in this clade, we can find loci that are single copy and are present in each of the genomes. These loci are taxon specific because they meet the desired criteria in the taxon whose genomes we're using. In general, this approach requires a lot of bioinformatic expertise. However, various pipelines have been developed to ease this process of locus discovery. However, as I just mentioned, this approach requires the use of multiple genomic resources, which requires time and money to generate and may not be available for the group we're interested in. Another approach is to look for more general or universal loci that are present in large clades of plants um, by comparing the genomes of more distantly related species. So these loci are likely to be found in these large clays of plants, for example, all angiosperms, although their applicability in any particular clade is not known. Some of these locus sets include the conserved orthologue set two in Eusterix, um, the single, shared single copy locus set 
uh, found by comparing the genomes of Arabidopsis, Oculus, Vitus, and Oryza, and also the pentatrichopeptide repeat gene family in Andrew's work. The anchored phylogenomics uh, locus set developed by the lemons uh, makes use of the, that APBO set. So for this study, I was interested in comparing how different taxon-specific and general locus sets vary in terms of uh, locus discovery, locus assembly, and sequence variation, and also how well these locus sets resolve the phylogeny. I focused on the genus Budlia in the family Scrophulariaceae. This genus comprises 108 species and has a crown age of about 100, uh, 20 million years. I used a pipeline Sondebach to identify the taxon specific loci. And for that, I used uh, one gen a genome from one species, Budlia globosa, um, which we sequenced in my lab and the transcriptome from another species, but later the vidii, uh, from the 1KP project. For the general loci, I used the three sets that I mentioned before. I took the sequences identified in a tomato for Costu uh, and a Arabidopsis for APBO and PPR, and I did a blast search for these in my Butleia genome. I further filtered these loci so that they had a so those kept had a minimum length of 600 base pairs. So how many loci did we identify in each of these sets? For my results, I'll show the results from the taxon-specific set in orange, and for the general sets in blue, for um, COS2, APVO, and then PPR. So here I'm showing the total number of loci identified and a total length of all those loci. For the number of loci in the general sets, um, I'm also showing the number identified in Butley on top and the number identified in the original publication on the bottom. The number in Butley was always a fraction of that total. And so here we see for both the total number of loci and the total length, uh, we had much higher numbers for the taxon specific set, which makes sense because Closely related species are expected to share, which we use for the taxon specific set, are expected to share more loci. When we look at individual loci in these sets, um, for the general sets, we see that the average length of those individual loci were longer on average. This might be advantageous for some analyses methods that require well resolved gene trees like Astral. However, for these results, uh, this, the specific numbers that we see would depend on the group and the pipeline that we use. Okay, so after identifying the loci, I developed probes based on the Butleia genome sequence. And then I did the sequence capture and sequencing on 46 species of Butleia, the in-group, and four more distantly related out-group species two in other genera in the same family, and two in other families in the same order. I outsourced the lab work to rapid genomics, and after sequencing, I assembled the reads with the pipeline high fiber. All right, so how many loci were we able to assemble in each set? This graph shows the percentage of the target loci with an assembled sequence in each set for the in-group taxa, the Butleia species we can see that the average was close to 100% in each set, though it was slightly but significantly higher for the taxon-specific and PPR sets. When we look at the outgroup taxa, we see a greater difference between sets. The taxon-specific set had a lower average, of, uh, lower average percentage of target loci with an assembled sequence, which we might expect since the taxon-specific set were identified specifically for the in-group. Looking at the uh, percentage of variable sites in the individual loci now, we see that the average was significantly higher in the taxon-specific and the PPR sets. 
For the phylogenetic analyses, I aligned and concatenated the assembled sequences in each set. I used RaxML to do a maximum likelihood analysis and SVD for types for a species tree approach. Here I'm showing the uh, percentage of nodes with bootstrap support greater than 90%. Uh, we see for SVD quartets, the support was consistently lower than for maximum likelihood, which is typical. Looking within analyses, uh, the taxon-specific set produced the most supported tree for RaxML, maximum likelihood, uh, with more than 90% of nodes with high support. For SVD quartets, uh, the PPR set produced the most supported tree. However, for, for all uh, data sets and both analyses, uh, the phylogenies were relatively well supported, uh, with more than 50% of nodes having greater than 90% bootstrap support. All right, to summarize, for the taxon specific set, we were able to identify much higher numbers of loci, which were variable, and this provided enough data to resolve a well-supported phylogeny. For the general locus sets, for which we required fewer genomic resources, we identified fewer loci, although still dozens to hundreds of loci in each set. These loci were longer on average, and in some sets, uh, comparably variable. And this provided sufficient data to infer a well-supported phylogeny. We also saw that these loci were applicable in more distantly related groups, those outgroup samples, not just in the group that they were identified in. And because of that, these loci can be applied in different groups, and the data can be combined across groups for larger analyses. I'd like to thank these various people and institutions for providing data, doing the lab work, um, and assisting with analyses and lab work, and also for providing funding. If you'd like to read more about this work, uh, it was published in apps earlier this year and is available there. Uh, thank you. question. Um, since you have more data collected for taxon specific um, loci or whatever, why would you expect lower support in your colossum based method compared uh -huh. to the Right, I have, I've been thinking about that a lot also. Repeat the question, please. So the question was, we have a lot more data in the taxon specific set but for the coalescence, the species tree approach, SVD for text, it didn't pr produce the most well-supported tree. Um, and I'm not sure what the answer is. It might be that um, there is not, there's more noise in those data and not as much information. Um, they, were, they weren't as variable as some of these general sets, so they might, with the bootstrapping process, it might not be you know, converging on the, the same result. 